at Possible and New Weather, um, Brooklyn Spoke and Paris Sans Voiture, we all want to see a zero carbon society which is built by and for everyone. And we want and need to see this happening fast. And that's why um, we're really happy to have this second session on reimagining London, Paris and New York uh, to mark our launch, which is going to visualize what's happening at the local level and giving us some sort of hope and sense of the possibilities of the future. We hope that the campaign is going to bring a very live positive vision for major cities to move away from mass private ownership, car ownership, and give space back to people and nature. But just to head off any misunderstandings before they um, begin, a car-free city is a, sea which, is a city which is free of the, the pollution and the life threats and the clutter of um, mass private ownership. It's not, a car, it's not a city with no cars at all, because there are many people, and we understand that, people with particular disabilities, mobility problems, who cannot get around without a car. But this campaign is about the radical reduction of the number of cars in cities, um, which will also make the lives of those people who really do have to use the roads that much easier. Um, we want livability, the conviviality of our urban spaces to be greatly improved by reducing the number of cars on the road. Um, and we're interested in best practice and sharing best practice and emulating best practice wherever we can. And with that in mind, we've got some fantastic speakers over the course of the next hour, each speaking for just five minutes each, so that we've got plenty of time for conversation and questions and answers afterwards. And we're going to be looking at the emergence of cycle lanes, car clubs, parklets, how communities can redesign their own cities. And the first person we're going to hear from is Shabazz Stewart from New York City. We've got speakers from London, Paris and New York City. I should emphasize that in this session. Shabazz is the founder and CEO of Uni, a company that's developed a smart pod that provides secure parking for bicycles and scooters. And previously, he served as Deputy Director of Operations at the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership. So with that, and for your five minutes, I'm going to hand over to you, Shabazz. Hi, uh, thank you so much for that kind introduction, Andrew. I'm going to attempt to uh, share my screen here. I uh, hope that it's been successful. Can everyone see that? Let me, uh, great. So um, as Andrew mentioned, my, uh, my time, um, my, my, my work with UNI began um, at the Downtown Booking Partnership um, where I was responsible for um, overseeing a portfolio of 1.1 million square feet of public space in New York's third largest business district. And I had a problem. And that problem was I kept on getting bicycles stolen. I would rely on a bike to get about two miles, three and a, three kilometers or so from my house in, in, in Crown Heights to um, my, my workplace. And I just could not keep a bike. And it, it was stolen right out from under me again in my own district. And it occurred to me that if this um, form factor, bicycles are really going to occupy a, um, a central and dominant um, mode share in cities, then we have to start thinking about parking and service facilities on a um, massive scale. And generally speaking, New York City is far, far behind uh, London and Paris and the work that those cities have done with respect to all things bike, but especially with respect to bike parking. London in particular has 150,000 or so bike parking spaces, 7,000 of, of which are secure. New York in 2015 had zero. <laughs> zero secure bike parking spaces. So um, I'm going to try to, oops, this is not, great. So um, one out of every four uh, households in New York City, about 2 million people have experienced bike theft. It is one of the leading barriers to adoption um, in cities. When you ask people, uh, people who already bike, which means people who are already comfortable with braving the streets, with um, with safety as you know, as a paramount issue. Why they don't bike more often, they'll often say it's because I'm afraid of having my bicycle stolen. I don't have a place to put my bike that I'm confident in at the either first part of my journey or the last part of my journey, end of trip facilities or beginning of trip facilities. Um, when we think about this in the context of car culture, um, cars have everything. They have affordable leasing options, but they also have parking spaces everywhere. So New York City has about three, between three and four million free curbside parking spaces. Um, there are parking garages that are required for all new buildings. Um, there are even municipal parking garages the cities provide. New York City has none of this 
for bikes and scooters. And yet we're expecting and hoping that bikes and scooters become um, a really relevant um, mode of transport. Now, I will say that before I go on that 75% of all trips in cars in New York City are under five miles, about half are under three miles. So if we're going to get to a carbon neutral city that's optimized for climate change, it's really essential that we start to transition those, um, those car trips to micromobility and preserve the use of the car for those longer trips, as Andrew mentioned, for people who actually really do need to go um, the distance. So Uni was about thinking and rethinking um, the role of bike parking and bike parking facilities in public space. And the theme that we're, that we're gonna kind of touch on here is why can't we have a turnkey option that serves uh, cities well? When I say turnkey, I mean uh, financing, operations, everything. The government just has to say, you go here. And why can it be free to use for the public? One of the biggest barriers to uh, bike parking is the financing and particularly in the cost to the user. And with UNI, we tried an omnibus solution that tackled all of those things. So designing high quality uh, financed facilities for public spaces in downtown environments. Um, and I'm gonna skip that. Uh, the first form factor, and before I talk about the pod, I will say that when we think systemically, you think about introducing 20,000 and 30,000 bike parking spaces um, into a urban context, we have to think about high density, medium density, and low density. So um, the pod was our first attempt at a medium density solution between 20 and 100 bike parking spaces um, in the context of a public plaza or ultra wide sidewalk environment. We started there because the number one need we would, we would get from property owners was, hey, you know, I'd like to have uh, 20 bike parking spaces. I have 300 square feet available um, and I need to, I don't want to pay for it. And so it seemed like that was a natural logical place to start to have high impact. Um, this particular pod is near the Barclay Center. It's got space for 20 bikes at a time. Um, and it features uh, space for advertising and space for e-bike charging. Um, and uh, it's illuminated uh, at night and has greenery on the roof. And this has been an extremely popular form factor that um, has really um, captured the imagination of the public uh, in the New York City region. And we are responsible, we work with the property owner for cleaning and maintaining the facility. I'm running out of time, so I'm just gonna briefly show you our next form factor, which is the Uni Mini which is designed specifically for curbside spaces, not that dissimilar from the bike hanger that is so, uh, that's so, useful, that's so popular in London. This is actually designed um, from a Parisian uh, bike parking uh, structure design. Um, and it's going to be uh, appropriate for curbside. Here in New York, we've got three and a half million or so uh, free curbside spaces for cars. Um, we'd like to convince the city to um, transition just 5% of those for micromobility, providing a more than a million secure micromobility parking spaces um, for the public writ large. Um, you know, the challenge here is, before I close, can we roll out a design that is not just utilitarian, it's not just something that we tolerate, it's something that is iconic, as iconic as a double-decker bus in London, or a London cab, or a New York yellow cab, or a Parisian metro entrance that complements the surrounding streetscape, can we finance it and can we make it not just a parking hub, but also a service hub? So I wanna be respectful of, the, of, of everyone's time. I think my five minutes are up. There's a, there's a lot more to unpack here, but I will yield the rest of my time and um, I look forward to questions from the audience. Shabazz, thank you so much. And if achieving change has something to do with the cultivation of um, different desires, that uni mini that you just showed us, can I just say, I want one. I want <laughs> one outside my house and I want it now. So thank you so much. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, and thank you so much for keeping to time as well. Um, so now we're going to move to um, Catherine Pion, who is General Secretary of the Club des Villes et Territoires Sea Club. I hope I said that correctly. Um, and it's an association which includes 200 local authorities of all sizes that have been working for more than 30 years to promote cycling. So with that, let, I'm going to hand over to Catherine. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you for this invitation. Um, 
This is a national association, as you said, that brings together towns, communities, departments, regions of all sizes in France. It um, has uh, goes from one commune with 3,000 people to the Ile-de-France region that has over 12 million people. So we really have a huge variety of members. All metropoles are members within the association, as well as rural areas and peri-urban areas, as well as uh, mid-sized towns. In terms of Paris, we have um, over 37 members in the association in the Paris Metropole, as well as the outskirts. The What we have in common is that we've all been around for over 30 years and these are all um, organizations that want to increase biking on a daily basis and this is not sport tourism cycling for tourism or cycling for sports but rather something that is um, a complement as Shabazz was saying something that is um, a complement to other types of transport so we can say that um, the bike has been coming for a while and um, there have been car-free days for a while as well. There have been other experiments that have been um, put together to test the positive effects um, that um, a car-free area has on cities. It also allowed us to see difficulties when we got rid of cars. So this was more for the city centres. These days were so fleeting they passed so quickly that some people said that they were rather almost um an excuse to let us have cars for the rest of the year but to not throw the baby out with the bathwater these symbolic days um did disrupt this symbol of individual um freedom that you have with a car when you have a car you have this idea that you can go where you want when you want but these days showed you that when you live in um, a decarbonized space, it's much more pleasant. Depuis les années 80, se sont progressivement élargies. Au début, c'était sur une rue, un petit quartier, et petit à petit, les choses se sont étendues. Ça concerne toute la France, mais je vais me concentrer sur la région parisienne, euh, puisque c'est ce qui a été demandé. Euh, par exemple, à Paris, euh, progressivement, c'est toute la ville de Paris qui a été mise en journée sans voiture. Euh, et puis, il y a d'autres expériences qui se sont produites, par exemple, euh, dans la ville de Montreuil, où j'ai été élue. Dans la ville de Montreuil, quand j'ai été élue, dans la ville de Montreuil, quand j'ai été élue, donc nous avons fermé la ville de Montreuil, donc nous avons pu organiser quelque chose, et les gens qui étaient marchés sur la ville de Montreuil ont dit, comment pouvons-nous obtenir ce espace Uh, the space back and how can we reclaim this and now this highway is closed and now we'll have a new tram line we have new uh, bicycle path and and we have the uh, the peripheric that's the surrounding uh, that's what's surrounding uh, Paris with the three lanes four lanes it's a huge uh, motorway and we have an experiment and uh, just based on the city of Montreuil and what we call the, the White Night, it was a cultural event in Paris. So we can actually close a section of this motorway between Aubervilliers and Le Lila, where they close the, the, the periphery. It was kind of a short, uh, a small revolution because people could walk on the periphery. So it's fantastic. There's you know, actually, uh, we can stop uh, traffic there. It's uh, fantastic, it's fun and so, uh, interesting symbol and now the fact is we want to go beyond the individual cars personal vehicle it takes a lot of time it takes a lot of time to change the behaviors and to reach uh to help people uh to give up on their cars because it's still a symbol of a personal freedom and it's just a symbol now and it takes some time and then we need to find and build uh alternatives what happened with covid well with covid we uh, help us to, to show that uh, something punctual, something a brief could, could be permanent. And because we can actually drop your car for the whole day, well, with uh, the lockdown, we'd allowed us to rediscover silence. And many people realize that actually, well, we can and we have to stop using our cars. This is why we widen the, the whole uh, idea and awareness about cars and also reduce the space uh, for cars. And it gave us a lot of uh, good uh, ideas. And 
to, to politicians and to, to tell them that you need to move forward. They need to have to work with drivers and to give initiatives and new opportunities. So we can actually multiply these opportunities and we could assess the, the effectiveness of these ideas. We had 1,000 kilometers of what we call corona tracks that were developed to uh, to have the development of bicycles. So 1,000 kilometers. And in one year, we managed to have 700 kilometers. So it was amazing and people were amazed by the speed uh, of this and the bicycles. In 2020, we compared to 2019, the number of bicycles were multiplied by 27 persons. So that's a huge change. It's an amazing change and was extremely important in Paris because we, we're talking about a potentially an increase by 67 percent of people using their bicycles. So it was uh, a window and it was an occasion and people took it and for the cars and for the, sorry for the bicycles it was a fantastic opportunity to develop the uh, to encourage people to take the the bicycles and the bicycle became uh, much more visible in the public place and so we have new uh, ambassadors of, uh, of bicycles so how do we do we need more time and how can we uh, encourage people to take their uh, their bicycles so we have to reclaim the public space so we have to uh, adapt new uh, places we need to have a shabbat set we need may have new parts we have new um, parklets we have small very tiny gardens and we may have so have like a side bicycle race tracks and we reduce the speed limits uh, at from 50 to 30 kilometers per hour. So it was even sometimes at 20 kilometers per hour. So we have new uh, protected areas, for example, uh, around schools, we have this new, um, this new ro this roads, where this quiet roads, as we call them, where we, kids can actually meet uh, in front of the school or on the roads and uh, with the parents. So in France, one of the main challenges is that uh, that we need to uh, to build on this enthusiasm and is this so it's not something uh transitory but something uh, more permanent and we have to see to increase the enthusiasm of this of everyone for this now i still have one minute left so just i, I, I can't one hear very you quick sorry. okay one minute more thank you very much Yes, thank you very much for this. Uh, so we still have some risks and we still have uh, to pay attention to what things are done. We still have the question of uh, social equality because uh, clean equality may uh, be quite expensive and to have a new, uh, an old car, um, a highly polluting car could be more expensive, more really cheaper than having a brand new car because you need to buy this new car. So make, make sure that the change shouldn't be too expensive. And this, this all the topic is the equality between generations because all elderly people, they have old cars and they uh, don't use their, their cars that often. They need to go to see their friends. And we must make sure that uh, these people, these elderly people who have to leave and they still need the cars, well, they must be, we shouldn't tell them they use a forbidden to use uh, their cars anymore. So we have the equality uh, among uh, territories and municipalities. It's fantastic to live in Paris because you have like different means of transport, you have cars, velibs, but in the suburbs, it's, things are more difficult because they have less uh, bicycle tracks and they, uh, sometimes it's very difficult to go uh, from one suburb to another. You have to go uh, to cross the, uh, the Paris. So we have to have, we need to have other options. We need to have other alternatives and it will take some time, but we, we can date it. Thanks to this, uh, the current health situation, we, we, we really noticed that everyone wants to uh, participate in this. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, Kathleen. That was fascinating. And having that long view on this issue, I think is really helpful and something that we will be looking at because very often the resistance to measures to improve cycling and walking and reduce traffic tends to be based upon people's fears that when the new measures are introduced, then evaporate and people are happy with the new circumstance. And yet it's the same debate we have again and again. And now staying with a Parisian theme. I'm delighted to introduce Vincent Bezaguet, who's an activist at Alternativa Paris and Action Climat Paris. Um, and Vincent leads the project La Rue et à nous, which I love, it works even in English, um, French for the street is ours. It's a coalition of several associations. The project aims to reduce road traffic in the city in order to reduce air pollution and to obtain a better sharing of public space as Catherine was talking about. So over to you, Vincent. Well, I think, thank you very much for your presentation, for your introduction. So, yes, um, I'm, a, I'm an activist in an association called uh, Action Climat Paris, who are advocating for uh, the social and climatic, climatic justice in Paris and in the Ile de France region. So, with, uh, when we talk about pollution, about uh, road traffic, of course, it's uh, there's something real in Paris, but also in the suburbs and most unfortunately the suburbs are the most impacted by this so we launched this campaign uh, more than uh, 18 months ago uh, after we once we realized that the uh, 50 percent of social space was for cars but cars only are a very small amount of uh, trips in paris so we realized that we have a better distribution of uh, this uh, social space and to give uh, some space back to uh, soft uh, mobility, for example, and, and other means of transport. So we thought about how to do things and one of our main assets is the uh, as citizens and uh, we really uh, to be disobedient and we should go, we agreed, we uh, allow ourselves to go beyond the law and to uh, to uh, disagree and say to, to, to state publicly that we disagree with a uh, public uh, plan. So we realized that uh, that many people are telling us that it's the, the capital of France. We, we need to have the car. We need to have our cars because they really uh, the economy depends on, on the car. But the, we have to need to adopt another point of view. So. The question, who are the most impacted people by uh, air pollution, for example? Well, we have children. And we quickly realized that uh, most schools in Paris are extremely polluted and they go way beyond the thresholds defined by WHO. And we say that if we could actually talk about this and we can actually uh, uh, have a huge impact on uh, our citizens, on the, the point of view of the citizens and change their minds, so we started to, to launch new uh, actions in front of schools in Paris. So would you show there was a problem of a pollution problem in, in schools and the space for cars now could be used differently. And this is what um, other organizations said today. And this is idea in, we have, we uh, blocked the whole road uh, in the most polluted school of Paris and the kids could go out and and have and play uh, on the road and so what what we want is to change the the mind of our citizens and we have a nice uh, drawing where we see that we do things in reverse that we have the people the pedestrians on the road and we just only have one car and for us it's it's really important to think, uh, to, to, to imagine the future, because uh, because we want to break this idea, this concept that the car is the, the ideal vehicle for everyone. And we need to need to change the, the mind of our citizens. And because we saw with COVID and we also have a, a huge strikes 
just before the, the COVID crisis. And so we see changes, but it takes a lot of time and we need to make sure that people uh, to get used to these new uh, changes. And so about schools, we were very lucky to have a new mayor who uh, had a, quite a lot of commitments, a long list of commitments uh, with environment. And the idea is to actually block uh, many roads, uh, the roads in front of 300 schools. But unfortunately, she said she would do it, but things are going very slowly. And she was elected eight months ago and we nothing's been, nothing much has been done. So we are still enthusiastic, we're still uh, committed to doing this, but we need to remind them that it's an emergency and we shouldn't wait too long for this because things, the problems are already here. So we need to think about how we can uh, show that it's going in the right direction without uh, blocking what they're trying to do. And But we shouldn't tell them that everything they do is great because this is not the case. So, and to conclude, we also try to, 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 to widen our, um, uh, our perimeter and we try to go beyond the, the, the frontiers of Paris and we started to work with municipalities, with uh, citizens, with the uh, inhabitants of small uh, suburbs and with as so we can create a very popular movement for uh, to promote these, uh, this concept uh, to tackle uh, climate change and pollution. And this is my conclusion. Thank you. Vincent, thank you so much for those hopeful images of action at the local level. I've also been seeing that there's some great conversation going on in the chat, some really detailed stuff about which are the best bike lockups. I like that very much. And I'm picking up lots of ideas for merchandise. I'm going to have the Uni Mini outside my house and I'm going to get a, a um, La Rue et à nous t-shirt to wear. I hope you already have one. And if not, please make one. Um, and now we've got two more to hear from, two more fantastic speakers to hear from before we go to your question. Even although please do keep putting your questions into the Q&A in the Zoom box because they can be answered directly. Um, next, I'm going to um, introduce, I've got the joy of introducing, um, it, well, if I introduce him as previously a councillor and cabinet member for energy, waste and transport in the London borough of Hackney, as fine as Hackney is as a London borough, it doesn't begin to capture the human dynamo that is John Burke. And even though he's only got five minutes, I know he's going to get a lot into it. So over to you, John. Unmute, John. There we go. It's probably best to unmute. And it's lovely to see so many familiar faces here. And in particular, Andrew, that you've gone to such lengths to make our French cousins feel so welcome, having come dressed as a, an existentialist philosopher to the, today's event. <laughs> so I, I want to very briefly talk about some of my kind of more recent experiences in um, taking inspiration from cities like Paris to radically transform the public realm, but also taking inspiration from um, deeply um, uh, uh, unreasonable local residents such as Brenda um, who have been uh, very demanding about you know how we address the issue of land use and equity in an urban environment and I think what we've done in recent decades is slept walk into a situation in boroughs like Hackney where 70 percent of households don't own a motor vehicle um, where there are you know it's very densely populated many households have no access to their own private green space or even communal green space in some instances and you know people like Brenda started to ask kind of demanding questions of what we were doing as a local authority about um, the land issue, you know, um, I could, I've only got five minutes, sadly, as Andrew notes, and I'd love to go back and talk about the rich tradition stretching back all the way to the English Civil War of Gerard Wynne Stanley and the diggers and the ongoing issue of land distribution in the United Kingdom. 
um, you know, uh, since the Enclosure Act, really. But we haven't got time for that now. But the point is, what we've effectively done with the motor car is we have allowed a minority of individuals, and this is no reflection on them as, you know, on, on a personal level, to uh, monopolize um, a large proportion of the land that's available in our urban environments. And if we are serious about um, addressing the multiple crisis that face crises that face our cities, um, uh, and particularly the environmental crises, then we simply cannot address the issue of surface transport emissions um, uh, and the inequity of land distribution um, without thinking about how we might reimagine um, the public realm. And I was a cabinet member for public realm in Hackney um, and kind of inspired by some of the tentative work that people like Brenda undertook to deliver parklets, which I'm sure she'll talk about in a moment. You know, that really gave us a sense of the latent demand for, you know, something other than parklets. Than, than cars on our roads um, and that kind of inspired me to develop a program called 21st Century Street which I think is most kind of relevant to um, the, 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 the panel that we're on today um, and I did provide Emma with, a, with an image of this but she may not be able to, to share it on my behalf um, and on one of the very streets that Brenda pioneered the delivery of a, of a of a parklet, which for those who are unaware, and most of you will be aware of what they are, they you know remove a space for a car and replace it with some non-exclusionary, non-rivalrous public goods where people can sit and meet the neighbours and chill out and generally enjoy themselves, which is you know what living in cities is all about. Um, you know, I then kind of took that idea somewhat further and thought, well, how can we kind of completely reimagine what this street needs to look like in order to be compliant with you know the carbon budget of the Climate Change uh, Committee on Climate Change and for the stretch and decarbonisation targets that we as a local authority were setting ourselves. And the result of that was the creation of the 21st century streets, which, which removes on a street of, and Brenda will correct me, but maybe it's 250 metres long, that street. It removes around about 100 metres of hard standing and replaces it with uh, a neighbourhood park immediately in front of a primary school, which which is deficient of green space, providing additional um um, uh, amenity value for children um, at the school um, and there are lots of households on that street that have no access to a green space so they'll be able to walk out of the front door and straight into their neighborhood park and my ambition uh, you know in so doing of course we eliminated 30 parking spaces, uh, a problem of um, idling engines where cars were driving up and waiting outside the marketplace at the end of that road. And this is in one of the most green space deficient areas of London and one of the areas of London with the highest uh, indices of deprivation. Right. And you know, my ambition is to create a, uh, an environment in which, yes, we still have roads and we still have um, you know, availability to park uh, motor vehicles, but that's significantly constrained and it's crowded out by, you know, you know, the principle of good stuff for everyone. Uh, I think one of the ways in which you can buy the approbation of the public to remove parking spaces is if you give them a park instead of parking spaces um, for them to enjoy with their neighbours. In addition to uh, the removal of the hard standing and the increase in canopy cover, which will reduce significantly reduce temperatures during extreme heat events, we have the amenity value and we're building into this 40% on-street canopy cover further down the road, which is consistent with the work of Carly Zeiter at the University of Madison, Wisconsin on scale dependent interactions between canopy cover and uh, street level temperatures and we're building in electric vehicle charge points secure cycle storage semi-secure cycle storage in the form of Sheffield stands um, and the delivery of uh, zero emission car clubs which will remove the need for people to own a car individually but still have access to one I think that in order for us to be compliant with the uh, the, 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 the the six carbon budget of the climate change committee you know the blended or the one of the least stretching targets is a, a reduction of of, um, the miles driven on London's roads by 17.4% in addition to the full electrification of land transport. That means that between now and 2050, London needs to eliminate 4 billion miles which are currently driven on its roads every year. We are not going to do that with supply side 
solutions alone. We need demand side solutions. The great beauty of the 21st century street is that it's both a demand side policy and the supply side policy. So you're giving people something good in exchange for space that they thought was previously for cars. But you're also at the same time eliminating hard standing, bringing down those temperatures, reducing the impacts of the urban heat island effect and heating on cities. And you're eliminating um, the space available for parks to do for cars to dominate in the first place. Um, and so you're reversing the trend for the passive um, acquisition and dominance of land by the motor vehicle by replacing it with neighborhood parks. And the final beauty of this as a structural solution is when you build them in, they're going to be so expensive to remove these neighborhood parks and so popular amongst residents that there's going to be no demand to replace them with car parking in the future. So it's a genuinely structural solution to the problem of car dominance in a mega city. And the final point, I know Andrew is probably looking at his watch now, but a final point I would make is one of the things we have discovered in London, in Hackney in particular over the last year, is that in a lower mobility world where people are taking fewer flights, are driving less, where people are staying in the neighborhoods in which they live, you've got to have good amenities for those people. And also, you know, our entire development model has been built upon the fact that 20% of the residents of the borough will be out of the borough at any one time. Well, when they weren't out of the borough last year because of lockdown, they were all in the parks and the parks were completely overrun. We need to be able to distribute um, our, our green spaces to ensure that the pressure is reduced on them. And a final point, given that Andrew has already um, displayed his wonderful French is I, you know, a lot of my work on reimagining the public realm has been inspired by the spirit of Paris and 68 and the expression, uh, sur la pave la plage, you know, under the pavement lies the beach. I would be perhaps inclined to change that to sur la pave la, la jardin, right? We can radically reimagine the public realm. We can tear up the hard stand and we can plant trees and we can give these spaces back to the residents of these cities. And in so doing, we can also eliminate um, the scourge of the motor vehicle in our cities without eliminating the benefits of it entirely. John, you're a genius and that rarest thing, um, a politician who actually makes good things happen. And that, jardin, you speak to. that jardin sous la pave will be a nice sandy, free draining and drought tolerant one as well, I imagine. Lovely swales. Uh, <laughs> And um, with um, just one more uh, visualization of the delights of good things which are already happening, and I can see that our graphic illustrators are doing a fantastic job of visualizing this conversation. I'm going to introduce um, Brenda Pesch, um, who is from the recently formed grassroots organization, the London Parklet Campaign. I remember the first time I saw a parklet, and it was in the most unusual setting of Los Angeles, the, the home of car dependence um, and her campaign seeks a simple and accessible procedure for residents and businesses to apply for alternative uses for car parking spaces and for community parklets across London. She won the Living Streets Charles Mayer Award in 2019 for a successful campaign on facilitating the creation of a program for community parklets in Hackney and she's an inclusive design consultant by profession. Now your five minutes as they say in the trade Brenda starts now. Um, right I'm just going to share my screen. Oh, da, 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 da. Okay, so uh, John Burke is a very hard act to follow. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Okay, let me start. Okay, start. All right. Okay. Right. Great to be here. I'm Brenda from the recently formed London Parklet campaign. And I'm delighted to be able to tell you about it. Parklets first came to London in 2015. Yeah. And uh, from California, 10 years after this quirky idea began in California. Um, my, uh, they came to London in 2015. My inner city borough, Hackney, was one of the first to start putting these in London. They started being installed across London to support outdoor cafe culture. This was great. However, 
been quite expensive. They were few and far between, and there was still no formal process to apply for one. Then COVID arrived. The government realized that outdoor seating space was needed during the pandemic. Cafe spillouts are now permitted under the post-COVID Business and Planning Act. However, this permission is only for commercial parklets and doesn't extend to communities and for residential parklets. But what about people on residential streets who need to socialize outdoors in a socially distant way or to play outdoors during the pandemic? It's still illegal to put out chairs and tables and meet friends outdoors. Any parked car has priority over children wanting to play in a parking space. That blank um, space there is, is a child playing hopscotch in a parking space that hasn't come out. Um, yeah, oh yeah, you can see it now, yeah, right. Um, winding, back to do, winding back a few years to 2017, as an, ordinary, as an ordinary resident, I had wondered if parklets could be allowed on residential streets. I felt you could get a lot more parklets if these could be done cheaply and quickly by residents themselves. I asked for permission to install a people parking bay on my street, but I was turned down. When I went ahead anyway and installed a cheap and cheerful parklet without permission, the reaction of the local community was overwhelmingly supportive. There were seven visitor books that filled up with comments. The council was not too happy um, and uh, it was evicted. However, a year later, the council eventually agreed to trial a community parklet program in 2018 with an online application process, exactly what I wanted. This was absolutely brilliant. Very quickly, residents started building parklets across Hackney, as you can see in the map. And eventually eight community parklets were being built. These are all homemade and unique, reflecting the type of street they're on. The process of collaborating on a parklet and using it brought the community on a street together in a way that had never happened before. The mark on place parklet was the center of an impromptu street party. Nightingale Road, um, the Nightingale Road parklet is just used by locals to sit there and chill out, listen to music. The herb garden, parklet is used by the entire street to collect herbs and have a chat while doing so. That's the, yeah, okay, that's the, the Nightingale Road one. And the Gelderston Road parklet is just a wonderful collection of planters. And the Beck Road one is the first, is the first COVID social distancing parklet that allows Catherine to sit outdoors and chat to her neighbors which would be impossible otherwise on those narrow footways and pavements. This is the Colveston Crescent Parklet that uh, John mentioned. This hosts, this is an amazing parklet that hosts mindfulness sessions and knitting classes. It also created a conversation about the street. You can see the banner there is how could this street be improved for all of us? on the parklet, asking people what they wanted. So the parklets did one more thing. People started saying that they wanted something better for their street. They wanted traffic improvements. The parklets became a catalyst for something much bigger. And these were being achieved. John has talked about the transformative 21st century street program that he pioneered. And Colverston Crescent, is to be the first one. That is a mega achievement. However, 
as the New Yorker John Orcutt said in his session earlier today, progress is not inevitable. Um, community parklets did not take off across London and were even halted in Hackney. They are guerrilla parklets being built, but if you want one, you have to be extremely motivated and determined, and you need to be living in one of the few London boroughs that turns a blind eye to them. Tired of fighting individual battles with London councils and getting nowhere, a group of us have set up a London parklets campaign. We want a simple and accessible process to allow us to apply for a community parklet on our streets or just to use the space for temporary social and community uses. We feel a bottom-up approach will allow a scalable, truly transformative community parklet process, giving people a stake in their streets, providing a sense of ownership and pride, allowing them to imagine a different future for their streets other than for storage of cars. We would love you to join our London Parklets campaign. We come from a wide variety of backgrounds and interests and welcome everyone. Thank you for listening. Brenda, thank you so much. And I find myself really quite moved by the sight of those people coming together. And it made me think as you were speaking that it's, it's people like you who are tenacious and creative and persistent who change the world ultimately yeah. from the smallest of places um so that's really rather wonderful so thank you to all of our speakers and we've got a little bit of time now for some questions um and to go with my t-shirt and my uni mini i'm gonna have a i'm gonna not stop until I get a parklet on my road in South London as well. Um, I just want to kind of kick the questions off to everybody opening. This is a kind of an open question to all of you, really. Um, but what advice would you give to people who want to begin the process of change in their neighbourhoods, in the, in the ways that, that you have? And perhaps we could go back to Shabazz, who we started with, um, for a quick answer on that. Yeah, I think that's a great question. You know, my perspective is, um, take risks and just do it. <laughs> you know, look, I think a lot of people feel that they have to run for public office or they've got to be part of a large corporation or organization. Um, but there's no reason that you can't get together with neighbors, uh, raise some money for a pilot and show people the right way it's done. I think there's a lot of power in pilots and proofs of concepts. And if you're passionate about something, um, then just go do it. The most committed usually wins, and you can create a compelling example for government and other activists who are probably less passionate about the issue that, uh, compared to you to follow in the future. That's fantastic. The most committed usually wins. There's a, there's a, a rule to live by. Uh, Vincent, what about you? Uh, but... Well... I think that yes, it can very easily take off thanks to residents, but there is a need for the residents to show the way. They need to show that this is what they want. It can start with just a few people. We saw, saw it with um, different initiatives. For example, Friday for Climate. Um, that started with a small group of people and slowly they mobilized. And we're trying to reproduce this over here with um, several parents who are very sensitive to the cause. And they will then go and transmit their passion, their knowledge, their will to change things. And progressively, this will turn into a community of people and it will have an influence on public policy and general public opinion because when you have 10 100 1000 people who all um, who are all asking that type of question this creates a debate and this allows room for change thank you Catherine. a quick thought from you um we oui, alors yes um 
Inhabitants can change many things, as well as elected officials. If we look at cities out of those who are elected, many want to try things, they want to innovate, they want to try, they're also convinced in these things and they need to convince their colleagues, their mayors, their, their presidents. So we need to give them courage, we need to encourage them so that they can do this. Now, following the health crisis, something came about and we call it tactical urbanism. It's very difficult for an elected official to say, I want a budget of two, three million to create a network of cycling, uh, of cycling areas because the money isn't there. And also people aren't sure, they don't want to mess up. They're not sure if it's the right route. Now, what am I talking about it? We're saying that with paint, we, uh, we actually paint a lane and if it works, then the, we create the means to finance it. But it demands a lot of political courage because here you're not waiting for the perfect solution and you're not waiting for the budget to be there. You're just trying something. It's um, a little less radicalizing for the opponents who are saying, oh no, but this, but that. Um, no, it's just a way of trying things softly, but with conviction by experimenting. And this allows you to then um, have a better way of doing things later, but perhaps not before. And I think that's a great way of doing things in the future as well for our towns. Um, well, I think uh, if we're going to talk about tactical urbanism, we should hear from one of the great tactical urbanists himself, uh, um, John Burke, who's also one of the most politically courageous people I know. Over to you, John. Have to ask you to unmute again. We don't hear you. Yeah. Maybe very, maybe, maybe a very good politician, not very good at Zoom. Um, okay, so I'll try to be brief and I'll bring my kind of perspective as a politician, um, as to what I think politicians should do. Um, uh, I think that Catherine makes an important point. Um, that, that a remarkable number of politicians um, lack political courage, which is kind of one of the fundamental components of the role. Um, and I can't, you know, that's a deeper question to which I have an answer to um, at, at this point. But I think my, my two recommendations to, to politicians who want to assist in this process or drive some of that change themselves is to draw on a really important anecdote, I think from, for, you know, from one of the, the great heroes of tactical urbanism, um, or, or urbanism more generally, and also just a quick reflection on finding the appropriate funding. When um, the New York City councillors um, voted down the, uh, the Washington Square Park Highway um, after a long and successful campaign by Jane Jacobs and local parents who used the park and were resisting the uh, the dominance of that space to the exclusion of families. I might add now, if anybody suggested the idea of running a, a four lane road through the middle of Washington Square Park, I don't think they'd get very far, but you know, this was a very real prospect. And when the, uh, the, the proposal was voted down, Robert Moses famously banged his hand on the desk and said, nobody is opposed to this scheme, but a bunch of mothers, mothers, mothers. And I think the lesson that we can draw from that is that politicians should not mess with mothers, mothers, mothers. And by that, what I mean is politicians need to go out and find coalitions and form coalitions, not just of mothers, but of other kinds of residents who will provide, who will help buttress some of the crumbling and, uh, sense of belief and courage when things become difficult. I know one of the things that was hugely beneficial for me was the support of organizations like Hackney Living Streets, which I know Brenda has been involved in very heavily, who were out there making the case for the low traffic neighborhoods and the record number of school streets that I delivered, even when some of my own colleagues were finding it difficult to muster the courage to do so. So it's very important that you establish those kind of coalitions with local residents. And on the issue of finance, I think I, I would give a really good example. When I became cabinet member with responsibility for public realm, I inherited a manifesto commitment of a net addition of a thousand trees. Well, you know, that's not a science-based target, as laudable as it was. And I wanted to ensure that we deliver green infrastructure that is commensurate with the commitments we've made, but also the demands climate science is placing on us, particularly from a mitigatory perspective. And, you know, I then developed a, a program to deliver 5,000 street trees, right, which um, is just under the amount that the whole city of Paris delivered from 2001 to 2006 over a two year period. 
uh, a thousand mature park trees and thirty thousand trees in our uh, green spaces are saplings um, in a in a joint venture with Trees for Cities. Now that whole program comes to a grand total of almost five million pounds, and there really isn't anywhere else in the country with politicians and officers that are willing to spend five million pounds on trees, however important they are, particularly in densely populated urban environments. And what I did was go away and look at the potential sources of revenue. And the classic of which was the parking revenue accounts. Trees are um, air quality infrastructure and they're therefore an appropriate spend for the ring fenced um, parking revenue account. And so what we've effectively created um, though we want to eliminate, you know, the, a significant proportion of the cars on the streets of Hackney anyway, what we've effectively created um, by using the park and revenue account to invest in non-exclusionary, non-rivalrous public goods, and particularly green infrastructure in this case, is we've created a kind of uh, polluter pays system whereby the, the controlled parking zones, the, the fines, uh, and the other measures that comprise the control park, uh, the, the park and revenue account are used to some degree to reinvest in the green infrastructure of the borough. I think politicians need to be creative about the funding solutions that they go looking for and not accept, um, you know, no for an answer. You know, conservatism with a small C is embedded in the culture of officers that's necessary because they will be there long after, you know, elected officials are, have moved on. Um, but it's extremely important, I think, to not accept at face value what um, you know officers say is and is not possible. I think you've got to test that to the point of destruction. That's great, John. I'm just going to jump in there because we're coming up to time, but I'm going to give Brenda the um, the last word. And there's lots more questions, and this conversation is going to continue. We've got another whole session where we can come back to these issues. But also, just to kind of throw in, there are a couple of outstanding questions about um, how important infrastructure is to um, persuade, like bike parking infrastructure is to persuade people to make that shift. And um, when you're dealing with um, trying to change the infrastructure at the local level with your parklets, for example, does that ever bring you up against problems with you know other competing road users the ubers of this world etc so just a, a last comment to brenda okay um well uh, first of all uh, it, you you want to start off with a progressive cooperative council as as we have in uh, in hackney and john burke but you don't always have that that's why we've got a london-wide campaign um to try and get the other councils to to have a, a park, uh, to have a process of allowing parklets, um, uh, I, you know, you know about competing uses of the street. I think cars have pretty much won that in terms of curbside storage. So, ah, uh, I don't think I think if we reach the stage where people are saying, "Oh my God, parklets have taken over the streets," I think we can then start talking about problems. About, uh, but I think having, you know our huge ambition of having one parklet per street is really a very low ambition. We should be having the parklets or community use of the street should be the default. And you can then, you can walk through a parklet or you, you know, a parklet doesn't have to be a permanent platform. It can just be people putting chairs and tables out and sitting on the street and having a chat with neighbors. You, you, that, that's what a parklet is too doesn't have to be a, uh, doesn't have to be a permanent uh, and you can have your loading and you can have your drop off that's not a problem there's plenty of space on the street cars are I'll tell you cars are parked on the street 95% of the time 95% so you know you there is a lot of space on the street that's being wasted so parklets are certainly not threatening that as yet hopefully they will in the future Thank you so much, Brenda. And that's a brilliant, positive note to wrap up on in this session. But just before we go into the break before the next session, um, if anybody wants to uh, keep up to date with the campaign and see how it's going to evolve, please go to carfreemegacities.org where you can sign up. We've got all sorts of things in the pipeline for the next few weeks, lots and lots going on. We're going to take a little break now for about um, 18 minutes and um, be back on the hour for the third and even more fantastic session, if that's imaginable, I don't think it is, um, uh, on, on the hour. So come back for that, please. We'll be showing a slideshow of images, including uh, some of our data visualizations uh, um, uh, for our upcoming website. Um, we'll thank you for that. And all, just a huge thank you for the 
power of the visualization, the imagination about the possibilities at the local level that we've heard from John, from Catherine, from Vincent, from Brenda, and from Shabazz. Thank you so much. And we'll see you all again in a short period of time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me.